Thank you all for coming to join us tonight. My name is Adam Levine. I'm director of the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies here at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. And we're so excited to host this wonderful panel uh, of individuals who are going to talk to us a bit about some important work that we have been doing at our Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies in collaboration with the Refugee Dream Center here in Providence. Re, uh, regarding the evacuation of more than 100,000 Afghan refugees from Afghanistan to uh, the United States uh, in August of last year. We're going to hear from our panelists about some of the findings of some research we've been doing, looking at the needs of this population, as well as a better understanding of their experiences in Afghanistan and during the humanitarian evacuation here to the United States. And we're also going to get to hear uh, from the Afghan refugee community directly and from the Refugee Dream Center about um, the work that they do here in Rhode Island. So I'm very pleased to introduce to you our three august panelists that we have today. First, Dr. Omar Ba, who is the founder of the Refugee Dream Center here in Providence. He himself is a uh, torture survivor, a former journalist, and a refugee from the Gambia. He's also author of the book, Africa's Hell on Earth, The Ordeal of an African Journalist. He has a uh, master's degree in counseling psychology and global mental health and a doctorate in organizational and leadership psychology from William James College. He also completed trauma treatment certification at Harvard Medical School through the Harvard Program in Refugee Trauma and he currently serves as an adjunct professor of clinical psychology at William James College, teaches global mental health fundamentals at Harvard, mental, at Harvard Medical School's program in refugee trauma. Next, we have Alexandria, who is our own civil military program coordinator here at the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies. She received her PhD in political science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. During her time there, her research focused on the nexus of international law and U.S. foreign policy. Currently, she leads all of our research and training programs related to civil military humanitarian coordination, including a number of large federally funded grants, as well as a longstanding collaboration with the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and the U.S. Naval War College uh, to host an annual conference on civil military humanitarian coordination. Finally, uh, we're joined by uh, Subhan Mohibi. He was born and raised in Afghanistan and recently graduated from Avicenna University in Kabul, where he earned his bachelor's degree in economics, finance, and banking. While attending Avicenna University, he published three books for the people at Elite Institute of English Language. Now he serves as the Refugee Dream Center as a case manager, where he helps dozens of refugees in finding housing, job placement, interpretation, and health and cultural orientation every week. He enjoys using his skills to contribute to every aspect of the exciting work that the Refugee Dream Center is doing. Without further ado, I will turn it over to our first panelist, uh, Dr. Omar Ba. Well, thank you so much, Adam. It's always good to be back <laughs> here. Uh, it's, uh, before getting started, I want to acknowledge the presence of uh, Dr. Cara Lewis. I think every refugee probably knows her. <laughs> she does an amazing work in the past couple of probably decades that I've, no, over a decade that I've known her. So <laughs> she's hiding, <laughs> she's blushing. <laughs> but I just wanted to thank Adam and, and your team for a fantastic job that you do and the collaborations and, and just realizing the need to connect with communities. Because you can be working top down and not see the importance of collaboration or, or talk at us but they come to us, work with us, hear our perspective, and then understand the importance of uh, community voices and perspective, because that is the best way to help people. I came to this country 15 years ago myself. I did not know anything here, no family, no friend, no community. It started from the bottom. So actually, that experience is what informed what I'm doing today. The, that led to the establishment. Welcome, welcome, guys. I think, I think this shuttle is here. <laughs> 
<laughs> this one. Great. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for coming once again. And I, I hope maybe somebody will translate to them at some point at when we're done. But um, I, I'll be very brief because I want uh, Alexandria and Mohebi to come down. I, I just wanted to say the work we do at the Refugee Dream Center or any partner in the refugee community is really crucial, and we cannot do it without partners like Brown or the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies. Uh, a good, a good uh, case in example was a couple of years ago, we got a small grant from here, and that was to help train eight community leaders, and we called them breaking barriers, because the bottom line is we cannot do the work without community leaders connecting with the respective ethnic communities in terms of language and access and cultural understanding. So we picked eight people from different ethnic communities and started training them and working with them. And we call them breaking barriers or survival leaders. And their work has been phenomenal. They reach out, they transport people, they interpret for them, they help us get to their homes. Sometimes a male like me cannot enter a home because of the gender differences, because of those cultures. So all those things we factor, and that is why we work with different layers of people. I, I, as I stated, when I came eight, 15 years ago, I did not know how to get myself to the hospital, for instance, to, the, to Rhode Island Hospital. I had no idea. I would take the bus, get stuck at Kennedy Plaza. So, sometimes I'll spend an, an, an unneeded number of hours counting how many stories <laughs> the, the, the Superman building has, you know, and the, all the Biltmore building has, counting those, you know, so it getting lost everywhere because and there was nobody to call. And I was volunteering a lot for people. At least I could read and write. I typed very fast. I would go to the International Institute and help people to fill forms and just really do whatever I can. And then I realized people need, for instance, moving from one apartment to the other. I have, I carried so many loads going from one apartment to the other just because I did not know what U-Haul was. I'll just gather a couple of volunteers, we'll go to the person's house because they're moving from one house to the other, and then we'll just be carrying back and forth on our heads, and the African way, you know, <laughs> so, because I had no idea about you all. So this, I'm just saying these stories because it's important for us to know when somebody is lifted from one place to the other, you are literally building your life from scratch, from the bottom. That is why refugees are a little bit uniquely different from the rest of the uh, immigrant population because you, you don't know where you're going, one. You most often do not know the place you are going until sometimes a day before your arrival, and you come with nothing. It's not like the typical story, oh, I came with $20 in my pocket at the airport. No, you come with zero, with nothing. You are forced to leave. You are not prepared for that journey. And in most cases, refugees are separated. Some are in different refugee camps, some are home. And so you are always split in between two walls. When you come, you are thinking of how to reunite with the rest of the family. And you are that kind of trauma that is a new form of stress or that you cannot just understand unless you go through the whole journey. So when the Afghani evacuation started last year, I thought to myself, as the founder of the Refugee Dream Center, I was a refugee, I was forced into exile, went to Ghana, and, and the kind of refugee camp I lived, I was actually re recounting that to somebody the other day. It was boxes, the walls were boxes, like this, these boxes you buy from Home Depot, and literally you just push it, somebody can come in from the bathroom that more than 100 people shared, when people so take, take shower, it will float into your room, and it's like, that is the worst thing that I will never wish for anybody. But I knew what a refugee camp is, and I knew that journey where you are forced to leave, go to a camp, or go to another country, then go through some process, and eventually come to America, which is if you have the opportunity. And by the way, with almost 100 million refugees across the world, is a very small percentage that end up in this country. So the Afghans started coming, um, when the evacuation started, I thought to myself, let me reach out to Adam because this is new. I mean, this is not the typical journey that happens with refugees. People just don't run to an airport and then get airlifted and come to the United States. 
and or get separated massively. Maybe one person comes or two people come. Everybody is stuck in Kabul or Qatar or somewhere else. It is a new thing that all of us have to learn. Whether you are a refugee, whether you've gone through the process or an immigrant, you must learn, especially service providers. If you are a teacher, a doctor, a case manager, you must learn. And even if you are a, a, from Afghanistan culturally, you must learn. So what we wanted to do was not to guess. As an organization, we wanted to try to, do, to get something empirical, something serious that can not only help our work at the Refugee Dream Center, but can be adapted to other refugee communities like Congolese or Syrians. You know, uh, we have a couple of Syrians that came uh, since 2015, 16, and then it stopped a little bit, but the families are still here, we work with them. Congolese, we have a big population here, uh, Somalis, there are people from all over the world. What can we learn from here, especially from the evacuation process, how abrupt it was and the journey that people took to come here, and how can that be adaptable to other refugee ethnic populations, but also across the country? I don't think maybe uh, Alexandra can help with your, with your search to see. I don't think any kind of study, uh, any study like this has happened about the Afghan population that just came across uh, in this country. So whatever we do here will be really phenomenal. It will be historic in the sense that it will be beyond science. It will be revolutionary because it will be a historic moment to learn about something that the Americans just did, airlifting probably 70,000 people or more to this country within a short time. No preparation. You don't go through what they say, cultural orientation in the camp, three days, learn about basic things about American culture. They did not have to go through that. It was a struggle. And then most of them went to military bases. And so it is a whole new world, a whole new journey. We are just trying to learn. We want that to learn. Open-minded, we wanted to learn. So I contacted Adam. And Adam, I, I know it's always busy here, but Adam was very gracious enough to say, OK, let's do this. And then that's how really this research process started. And uh, Alexandria has been doing a phenomenal work leading it and just you know, crafting uh, research uh, uh, questions and just the idea of what we want. And it was really back and forth questions. Adam's emphasis was, is what you guys want. And what we want personally, even when I'm sleeping, you wake me up, is how, what do they need? What does the population need? They just came in, what do they need? It cannot be just generalizable of what we've been doing with every refugee population because one unique thing is even the journeys they took are different. So we need to know what they want, the immediate needs of this population. And uh, the other things, I will not delve more into the details because Alex Alexandra will go into that. <clears throat> we wanted to see the evacuation experience of this population, what people experience being abruptly literally bundled up in, in military planes and then flown out. It's like a whole, it's like waking up from a dream. We wanted to know what the evacuation experience was. Because that will help providers like doctors and psychologists, even teachers, especially the public school system. And I think even this week, Mohebi with Teddy are struggling with a family that is having a, a lot of problems in the public school system. Because actually, I was with Teddy on the phone when she called to join a meeting. And one thing I had was, oh, there was no eye contact. I said, Teddy, I don't know how you guys are helping this family. But I, re I personally, I think I need to join <laughs> so that we can <laughs> make some noise. Because eye contact cannot be a basis for you to start putting people in specific places and uh, diagnosing them or stuff like that. Because it's cultural. But those are things that we can also offer others. And I hope some of these things will come up, like some of these nuances will come up in this study. And you know, whatever comes, it will be very accurate because it's the people telling us, especially with the approach with the mixed method. So I, I, I just wanted to say thank you once again, Adam. Thank you, Alexandra, for all the fantastic work. And of course, Mohebi, because he helped us you know, with the community, because you need that trust, you need that uh, integration, we need that bridge building to go back and forth. Language is huge and all the interpreters and people who help within this process. And uh, for me, I think the idea is always be open-minded and willing, be willing to learn. So thank you so much once again. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And I want to extend a special welcome to our guests from the Providence Afghan community. Thank you for coming tonight. And welcome to Brown University. So again, my name is Alexandria Nyland, and I'm the Civil Military Program Coordinator at the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies. So in this role, I manage all of the research that has to do with looking at how civilian institutions like humanitarian organizations work with militaries and armed actors during natural and man-made disasters. So a key part of um, the CivMil program is to make sure that we're conducting academically rigorous empirical work that's user friendly. And um, that's especially true in the case of this specific project, which we um, are aiming to have programmatic policy and academic impacts. Uh, the evacuation of more than 100,000 refugees from Kabul, Afghanistan last year was the largest humanitarian evacuation in recent memory. It's vital that we learn about the successes and failures of this operation from the perspectives of the Afghan evacuees themselves so that we can learn in order to improve uh, future humanitarian evacuations and uh, aid with the smooth resettlement of this current population in Providence. So this project has two goals. One is to assess the refugees' immediate needs. We want to know what kinds of goods, services, and support this newly arrived population needs, and how we can help them feel more at home and integrated in Rhode Island. The other is to document the experiences these individuals had working in Afghanistan with the US military or government, as well as their experiences of the US evacuation. We've partnered with the Refugee Dream Center to conduct interviews with the Afghan evacuees settling in, resettling in Rhode Island. So this data was collected in Providence over the period of October 2021 to August of this year. This included desk research, issuing three different types of men clinical mental health screeners, and conducting 32 semi-structured interviews with members of the Afghan refugee community resettling in Providence. These interviews were both in person and virtual, and they were conducted in Dari Pashto in English. We are using a grounded approach to analyze these transcripts. So this means we are going to go into the analysis with as few preconceived concepts as possible in order to let the key themes really emerge from the data. We are doing this by qualitatively coding the interview transcripts in in vivo. So while analysis for this project is still ongoing, several important themes have already become clear in the data. And I will briefly share three of them this evening. These themes all, uh, these themes all draw on the interviews uh, conducted and hence offer an on the ground perspective of the US evacuation. The first two themes I discussed focus on the actual evacuation, while the last one focuses more on an important concern post resettlement. So the first theme is informality. As was very publicly shown, the lead up to the US evacuation of Afghanistan was chaotic and urgent. This is due in large part of the collapse of the Afghan government occurring much sooner than intelligence projections had estimated. After the fall of Kabul on the 15th of August 2021, Hamid Karzai International Airport remained the only non-Taliban controlled route out of the country, being protected by several thousand NATO troops. Thus, it makes sense that every interviewee described a chaotic experience of both the evacuation and uh, the actual uh, of the airlift and how they learned about their eligibility for the evacuation. Once leading up to the US evacuation, participants reported that they were given very little information about if they were eligible. So many reported that they were notified within a moment's notice that when it was time for them to leave their country, perhaps forever. Once notified, they were forced to quickly gather their belongings and make their way to the airport in Kabul. In some cases, participants were not able to bring their family members because they were either too sick to travel or not an immediate enough family member to qualify for the special immigrant visa or SIV uh, since they had not worked with the US government. 
Um, however, many of those who were eligible for the SIV visa were also left behind. Estimate, estimates put this a number at between 70,000 and 100,000 individuals who are eligible for evacuation who have been left behind in Afghanistan. One of our interviewees, a soldier from the Afghan army, described fighting with his unit all the way to the Kabul airport, then guarding that airport for seven days and that before being evacuated himself. This individual reports not understanding that he was to be evacuated until the day of his evacuation. This chaos reportedly led to a level of informality in the operation. For example, having an individual connection with someone either within the US military or the embassy often helped expedite the notification and evacuation process. There are several examples of US military service people going above and beyond to help the individual Afghans that they had fought alongside. <laughs> Additionally, some interviewees reported that it was only at the discretion and the humanity of individual US military personnel that allowed uh, many civilians to gain access to the Kabul airport. Seeing the human effects of lacking an exit plan reportedly led indi to individual acts of compassion on the part of the service members. So this helped more civilians gain access to the Kabul airport, but it simultaneously created an even more chaotic situation on the ground since many of these individuals were not eligible to be evacuated. A second key theme is the differentiated experiences of men and women. The experience of male and female Afghan evacuees varied drastically at every stage of the operation. First, there is the most basic question of who is and is not left behind and the consequences of being left behind. In Taliban-controlled Afghanistan, we've seen a rollback in women's rights to work and to education. Several interviewees described great anxiety over the fate of their female family members who were left behind because they were either ineligible or because they couldn't get to the airport on time. Some report that their teenage daughters who had previously been going to high school and had plans to go to university no longer see a future for themselves. Others described dangerous environments at the Kabul airport, which created all kinds of protection issues for women and girls. The perceived danger of the largely male-occupied and militarized space of the Kabul airport reportedly led some individuals not to bring their female family members, even though they were eligible for evacuation. Second, and relatedly, is a question of agency. As discussed earlier, other individuals, uh, only individuals eligible for an SIV, visa, uh, SIV and their immediate family members were supposed to be evacuated. Few women worked with the US military in Afghanistan and men eligible for evacuation were allowed to bring immediately, immediate family members with them to the US. This means that even in cases where women and girls were evacuated, they were often in large part brought along as dependents. So women's literacy rates and ability to speak a second language are much lower than Afghan men with literacy rates around 23% versus 52%, meaning that the burden of resettlement in the US is especially difficult for them. These findings are of course not particularly surprising. As we know from other cases, women and girls are particularly vulnerable at every stage of a humanitarian disaster. However, this data does contribute to a growing body of evidence that calls for a more gendered approach to studying civil military operations. The final theme pertains to one of the most cited concerns about resettlement back uh, in Rhode Island, and that's family reunification. Once in Rhode Island, participants describe the positive, generally positive experience of working with both the Refugee Dream Center and Dorcas International Institute of Rhode Island. And uh, most participants um, raised, actually did not uh, raise concerns in regards to uh, finding affordable housing or finding, being connected to resources with their children. But the number one concern that people raised was the actually about um, stress about providing financially for family members who were left behind, as well as stress over bringing family members to the US so that they can be reunified. 
As such, some participants are working with RDC uh, or seeking legal counsel to be able to um, expedite the family reunification process. As can be seen from some of the examples in the earlier themes, many families were torn apart during the evacuation, some quite literally on the tarmac of the Kabul airport. In one instance, a participant described having to leave her eldest daughter behind because she had recently gotten married and had to stay in Afghanistan with her husband and his family. In another in instance, a participant described having to leave his child and his wife behind because his wife was too sick to travel to the airport. Regarding participants' other aspirations for the future, most participants would like to either work or further their education. Participants also described wanting to buy their own homes and help other Afghans who are resettling in the U.S. In terms of next steps for the research project, uh, the, our team will continue the analysis and phase into the writing stage this semester. The outputs from this analysis will yield one practitioner-friendly report on our findings, a one-page policy guidance, and an academic manuscript. And it is my pleasure to step aside and let Mohibi take the floor. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. My name is Subhan Mohibi. I'm from Afghanistan. And I am one of the recently evacuees that came and settled in the United States. So do you want me to interpret the, what you guys said or I should go with myself? Okay. okay. Before I should start my uh, speech, I'm going to translate for Afghan families what they uh, said in English. So Dr. Omar uh, uh, was first. پیشدید ما مثل شما بودم یعنی نمیفهمیدم که کجا برم حتی نمیفهمیدم که بس مرا چطور باید بگیرم بس موتره رابطه ساختن یعنی برام بسیار مشکل بود چون زبان نمیفهمیدم ارتباط بسیار سخت بود اما با مرور زمان ما همه چیز یاد گرفتم فهمیدم درس های خودم اینجا تکمیل ساختم بالاخره به فکر ازی شدم که یعنی ما چطور من حیث یک پل بین مردمی که در اینجا میآیند از کشورهای مختلف از نژادهای مختلف با مردم امریکا اونا رو وصل بسازیم که میگه در فکر ما اومد ما باید یک ارگانایزیشن باید ایجاد بکنم که می ریفیوج دریم سنتر که امروز میگه شما میبینید در ابتدا به این گونه نبود ما بسیار از صفر شروع کردیم شما میتونید وقتی که از کشورتان اومدین ما مطمئن هستم که شما بسیار چیزا رو پشت سر گذاشتوندین اونجا رها کردین اما اینجا شما فکر کنید که از نو یا تازه همه چیز را آغاز میکنین کوشش بکنین که رابطه بسازین کوشش بکنین که درس بخونین یعنی امریکا جایی است که شما میتونین خود بسازین اگر بخواین که پیشرفت کنین یعنی بهترین جای بر شما می است اگر بخواین که رابطه بسازین بهترین جای شما فعلا قرار دارین هست ما بسیار متاثر هستم از مردم افغان نه تنها از افغان البته از دیگر ملیت هایی که در اینجا هستن یعنی رنج میبرن زبان رو نمیفهمن دسترسی به امو منفعت هایی که از طرف دولت باید برشان محیا باشن ندارن یعنی تمام امو مرز هایی که برزی ها بسته هست فقط زبان یا بس چیز هست که یعنی دسترسی ندارن کوشش بکنین که زبان را یاد بگیرین کوشش بکنین که رابطه بسازین همیشه تاکیدشان هم یا بود ما کوتا برتان میگم خب الکس همچنان در مورد امو پروژه که با تمام افغان هایی که اینجا بودن ما 
امرویشم دیدن یا مصاحبه داشتن گفتن ما با دو قسم یعنی مصاحبه خدا پیش بردیم که هم آنلاین بود و هم با شکل ازی بود که ریفیوج دریم سنتر بر ما زمینه را مساعد ساخت تا بیایم به امرویان ها گپ بزنیم رو برو ما بسیار خوشحال هستم از تمام کسایی که اشتراک کردن البته در همین پروژه ما آمدن ما ما یک نتیجه بسیار خوب گرفتیم که میتونیم به دولت را پیشکش بکنیم دولت در آینده های بسیار نزدیک بر شما انشالله کمک های یا امون نتیجه شاید ببینین بخیر و بعض تجربات خدا گفتن از بعض فامیل ها که یعنی اشتراک کردن ما گفتن که حتی فامیل های بودن که یعنی تفلای خدا ایلا کردن حتی دختر جوان خدا ایلا کردن یا کسایی بودن که حتی شاورشان ایلا کردن کسایی بودن که خانمایشان ایلا کردن نتونستن بیاین بخاطر که راه بسیار دشوار بود و تجربات بسیار تلخ را پشت سر گذاشتن نام اوکی وانس اگین ویلکم ایوریون I'm from Afghanistan. I have been evacuated along with my wife uh, and settled to Rhode Island on December 2021. I'm very happy to have valued here. You all are very valued for me. And a special thanks to Dr. Omar, founder, and Ms. Teddy, co-founder of RDC, trusted and deserved for me a position as a case manager. Alex. Thank you so much for providing this event and giving me a chance to speak on it. A little bit about the journey and traveling to US. I always say for me and for my wife, it is a little bit uh, cut. If you have got an idea, start today. There is no better time than now to get going. That doesn't mean quit your job or jump into your idea 100% from day one, what Dr. Mar said. But there's always a small progress that can be made to start movement. There is always time to move. I always try to be positive and motivate myself, my wife, to move forward, although we have passed very tough times. After the Taliban seized all borders crossing, Kabul airport were, remained the only secure road out of Afghanistan. People were agitated. They couldn't think nash, rational what to do. Why I said rational, the people did. They couldn't take their decision. What should they do? Because they, because they had very bad experience from past regime. We had two, it is the second time that we are experiencing of Taliban in Afghanistan. And all were in fear, what will happen? Life changed, government changed within 24 hours. You sleep and get up see the government gone down. It is not easy. I saw in social media that Taliban were in presidential palace. I jerked my head uh, for myself. I told, is it true? I was, I have remember, I was in my mother-in-law house. When I got up, I heard the Taliban were in some provinces, but not in the capital. Um, even in the last minute, we were not sure that the Taliban will take the, the seas of the capital of Afghanistan. But when I saw in the social media, so I was shocked, actually. So, and my wife was in downtown, and they were buying. So actually, if we are going to take a picture of this idea, nobody were informed. Moving from Afghanistan was not uh, so easy as we talk about today. I just talk about, but being in rush and real situation, oh, that's tough. 
thousands of people were trying to get and throw gates and flee from Afghanistan. There was panic, fear, and crucial time to choose your way. People left their properties, assets, family, relatives, friends, and the most important education. They could build their future. But unfortunately, right now they're here with nothing. People were in a school, college, or in specific courses, uh, everything gone end and got down. They started from beginning in the US. People spent months in their journey towards the US. I spent over three months on the way to come through Qatar, Germany, and finally we reached us to Wisconsin. And I stalked for over three months and 10 days. After we settled to Rhode Island where we never heard about, about that before, we didn't know the location, culture, people, benefits, sources, medical treatment, which is very important for people, places or educa educational places. We have to learn at least the barrier of language. So most of the Afghan people right now, they're here, they have barriers of language, language. They don't know how to speak. It was hard, it was hard and very hard. I have remembered for the first day of our settlement, it was at BNB on Auckland Avenue. We reached out, it was night, and we didn't see anything. When it got morning, I have my mother-in-law, she's sitting right here, uh, she was crying and she was totally changed. Her mood, not only her, but my, my wife uh, as well. She told me my mother has been changed. Let's go around and we see and find some Afghan to talk at least. We can change our mood and take a breath. It was harder than we thought. Um, when I was in Afghanistan, I was telling that we are going to US and we will find uh, a good life. At least we will be safe and secure. But when you came here, you will have a lot of difficulties. The most difficulties when you don't have your relatives, friends, that is most difficult. It was harder than we thought, I told. But thankfulness of US government, as usual, stood along and brought out who worked with and never left behind. Every day I was scaring, and beside that, I was that I was feeling positive for receiving email from them. We were in touch, they made certainty. When I was in Afghanistan, it was August. I have remember August 14, the Taliban came in and we got out on August 24. So it is almost 10 days we were uh, in Afghanistan with the Taliban uh, that they have uh, a regiment there. So every, and the 10 days I never gone out because I was working with uh, US government and my wife was, she was happy that she is going to America and she is going to buy some stuff to take it and grab it. And we never know that we, we cannot take uh, our clothes because thousands of people were there and the gates and they're forcing to get in and they were scaring and fear too much. Um, they, they're finding a spot to get end of the airport. Uh, most of the people that they were eligible, right now they left behind and they couldn't get in. Uh, still, I'm happy that they're bringing out the people from Afghanistan, but they did what they could to do. Believing on current government in Afghanistan is tough and difficult. It is like, Everyone is a genus, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its whole, its whole life believing it is stupid, right? Yeah. 
So right now, the Afghanistan government is like that. If you think that they're going to make and allow the people to go to school, that is another idea. I thought, I have experience of them. Uh, the people that they have experience of that regime, they never trust on them. Afghan people who have experience for X regime, they never trust on, and still they have prohibition of girls from school. And that's very bad. Uh, this is a very huge sabotage for, the, for their future. Learners left behind one year due to pandemic, and it is now one over year. It's almost one over, over one year for the regimen of uh, Taliban that they are a state away from their education. Everyone has dreamed to reach out in a position, but unfortunately, thousands of girls disappointed and stressed back home in Afghanistan. I am, an, I am as an Afghan request across the globe, uh, please don't forget Afghanistan and decide people suffer too much. As Dr. Omar said, reporting, so there's a lot of ideas and a lot of experience uh, from evacuees that I came, so I just going to through it very short. So as Dr. Omar said, regarding RDC programs, once again, I personally thank you so much for establishing of such organization. We have more than 400 Afghan evacuees families here at uh, Rhode Island. RDC delivers safe, life-saving assistance, help safeguard, develop solutions that ensure people have a safe place called community, where they can build a better future and relationship. Try to get it. Uh, Refugee Dream Center need for your help, for, uh, for volunteers to serve for people. People need for learning of English language. At least, if you could not give them cash money or you cannot give them anything like, how do I say it? Uh, teaching of English, that is from your heart, from your brain, and you will not expend. The only thing I'm sure that you will expend, that will be energy, but that is a big help for them. Thank you so much. We work with families from different countries and nations using our expertise to protect and target is to be self-sufficient. The only target that I found, it is almost seven or eight months I work with the Refugee Dream Center. Uh, they're going to the people be sufficient and self-sufficient is so important for them. RDC greatest asset is workforce. We work with passionate, talented, and creative individuals who want to use their skills for good. Thank you so much for patient and valued time. Thank you, and thank you so much again to our panelists. So now we want to open it up to Q&A from the audience. I would ask just that you come up to one of the mics, and we can take questions for the next 15 minutes or so. Then uh, we will go outside for our lovely reception. We have wonderful food. We hope all of you will uh, join us and continue the conversation afterwards. We also, for those who uh, will need to pray at 7.15 to 7.30, we have a special space set aside, uh, which we will uh, have someone to show you where it is, um, and you'll be able to do that and then come back and join for the reception. So please, uh, questions from the audience. That's probably a good idea, yes. Maybe Mohibi as well. You can say if any of the members of the Afghan community want to ask a question or make a comment, uh, you can translate for them as well. 
Meten el calzón al saco. You can go to the mic so everyone can see it. It's just uh, live streamed in, as well, so people online will be able to hear you at the mic. <laughs> um, my name is Batul, and my question is about the research that you're doing. Um, so you mentioned about the, the uh, result that you got it about the human rights and the military and all. Um, I, want, I was interested about, um, because there was some about mental health and all, uh, will you do, it's like the mental health part is also included in that, or you just yeah. wanted to see how much, um, you know, the um, PTSD is present among the population. I want, I'm interested to know about that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, and thank you so much for that question, and um, I will answer it, and then I'll turn it over to Omar as well to add on a bit, um, because that's his area of expertise. So um, the way, I can go into more detail about how we structured the interviews. So before each interview, we uh, issued uh, three different clinical mental health screeners, one for anxiety, one for depression, and one for PTSD. And we are absolutely going to integrate the results of those screeners into our um, report that we're going to share directly with the Refugee Dream Center so that they can get a better idea of the mental health status of the individuals that they're um, trying to reach. Well, when, when refugees come and you ask them what they need, most of the time people will, will talk about the basic human needs like uh, food, housing, uh, that, that sense of belonging, reuniting with family members back home or sending them money. And it's very easy to over, overlook the mental health status. So that's why we included it because we wanted to capture that, not really to the extent of diagnosing, but at least getting a certain, uh, some sort of a picture of what the mental health status of these individuals are. So that you can, you can use that to refer or at least have an idea how to go forward, not to just focus on the basic human needs. Because you know, I personally I had a problem with this Maslow hierarchy, where you have the basic physiological needs, then you come to the psychological needs. I, I don't think that's correct. It should be both integrated at the same time. Yeah, yeah and I really like how Omar um, called it a, uh, like a snapshot. I, I think that that's a great way to describe how we did it in the, in the study, more of a snapshot um, to get an idea of the population rather than um, diagnose it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, please come up to the mic. So my question is also related to uh, Batul's question. So uh, given the barrier culture, how do you think, uh, how, uh, do, do your program plan to address uh, um, their mental health issues that you found, like PTSD, if you found, would your program address those mental health issues? And if so, given the uh, barrier, uh, culture barrier, how are you gonna plan to address it? Because it's it's very hard, and then they also know the they don't know the language. So how are you planning for that? Yeah. So 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 the bottom line is, this the outcomes will not be will not be unique to a particular individual. Actually, everything there is no identifying information. So it will be general to the population the specific population to say, for instance, I don't know what the results are yet, but we'll, let's say, 70% reported high scores or positive scores of uh, uh, anxiety. Then we know we must provide these services. Very mindful of stigma and cultural nuances because that could be across the board for almost every refugee or people from different cultures. So the tool that was used is, I think, is the RHS 15, right? Yeah. Is the Refugee Health Screener 15. It's called that because it has only 15 questions. There are some items that deal with uh, just PTSD and some deal with just uh, depression and some anxiety. And a combination of those three 
you are not diagnosing the person, but I think 12 and above, a score of 12 and above shows that this person needs referral. And that is what we need as, as a service organization to know, okay, how do we refer or how do we provide these services? Or probably then we can talk with potentially funders or partners and say, let's do a clinic or even a clinic, let's say a mental health clinic may not even be enough because that may still create stigma. Mm. Because somebody comes to the refugee dream center, then they go to another room and somebody's doing counseling, you may still not be addressing this stigma problem. Mm -hmm. But maybe we can walk into, let's say, a primary care doctor's office or the Carol Lewis and others and say, okay, one day a week do a refugee clinic at the refugee dream center. That way, if you do them together, the, clin the uh, uh, health, the physical health part and the mental health part, then people may not be uh, stigmatized and you're doing co-location of services and at the same time people are served in a holistic way. I'm just thinking what could happen, but you cannot do all those things without capturing this immediate mental health status to know, to make a case, an empirical case that this is where this population stands and this is a must, it must be provided. So that was the idea and then I'll pick it up from there. Hi, um, I had a question about uh, humanitarian parole and people who are on a temporary status and if you are doing anything to advocate for people who are, you know, don't have a pathway to permanent citizenship or, you know, to citizenship in the long term in the U.S. and if you're doing anything uh, with those people to either advocate for them or um, find solutions for that problem. So maybe Isabel can comment because I've seen the Refugee Congress in Washington that doing an advocacy program right now to ensure that Congress passes this, I think, Afghani State Act, what is the specific name of the act? But there's a bill that is currently in Congress because everybody, people are sort of stuck and it's, um, it, it, they are in limbo, sort of. And we are afraid when the Ukrainians come, it will be similar. You've seen what happened to the, some Liberians and Haitians through the TP, uh, TPS program for a long time. It is not a path to citizenship. It is not, uh, I mean, even if you end up getting a green card, it's a long process. We spend little, I think now I took, I have personally, I argue with the grant writers all the time. Why are you not including legal money in the budgeting when you are submitting grants? Because that's our biggest problem now. We spend so much money on lawyers, on filing fees, and people don't want to go to the pro bono stuff because it takes forever. It's a long line, long queue. So that's a, a national level advocacy that is happening through the Refugee Congress to ensure Congress passes something tangible. This is good, but we need something more solid. Psychologically, it's going to be more stable for the people. And then they can also be able to reunite with their family members in a faster and better process. And uh, at local level, we are just trying to do the best we can to ensure that we pay for the legal fees, filing fees. And some, some immigration lawyers are a little bit cheap. So they, they, they're doing it for humanitarian purposes too. But I think, I mean, this is where all of you can come in, students, teachers, volunteer. I mean, there are certain forms. We don't need to pay lawyers. People can help us to, to, to help you know, with that advocacy. And um, hopefully maybe at state house level, at, you know, we, even making an appointment with the senator's office is hectic. So that's where we need that kind of policy and advocacy. It took us a while to get uh, IRS approval when we established the organization because we, we insisted that the word advocacy will stay, and they did not like that. <laughs> they thought it's going to be like a political thing. Mm -hmm. But we wanted advocacy to be there because we know it's going to be part of our work. Yeah. And I'll add one of the uh, programs that our Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies has had for several years is our Student Clinic for Immigrant Justice. And so we actually have a cadre of Brown students who uh, work under uh, the supervision of uh, immigration lawyers to help asylum seekers here in Rhode Island navigate the often very difficult and complicated process. And that's gonna be even more true for many of these Afghan refugees because of their special status that they're coming in on. Yes. Hello, thank you so much for coming out today and speaking to, uh, to us. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm uh, the president of Brown Democrats and we are trying to uh, expand our outreach and just um, getting involved with local organizations and um, I was just wondering how do you think it is best for student organizations to either collaborate with one another 
um, in order to further these policy initiatives that Refugee Dream Center may have or to kind of how can student, my question is how can student organizations support um, our Refugee Dream Center initiatives? Okay, okay thank you for your question. Uh, right now we have a, uh, we have a new systematic uh, for ESO, uh, for Afghan refugees, not only for Afghan, for different kind of nations uh, from Congo, from Africa. Uh, so they, they have barriers of the English language and they want to learn. Uh, it is happy and pleasure for us that we have a lot of uh, students from Brown University, teachers even uh, from school. So they have uh, collaboration with us, so they have supporting with us. So we have a system uh, and also we have a, a spatial system for learning of English. So we can uh, create account for, for students and also for teachers, they can go with that. So it, it, it has in three categories. They can go in person, virtually, and also we are going to mentor. It is, looks like mentor, mentor and mentee. So you can go at their home to teach them in person. So we, we're looking for the uh, learner and the teacher. So then we, we will organize them. Okay, yeah. thank you. Refugee, refugee youth and American youth, so we mentor them. So we have about, uh, I will say, up to 30 youth, and we are all look, they are all looking for mentors. So it's just like how he explains the adult English education and also it's the same as the youth. It's just to keep them motivated, especially um, mentors who are already in college or graduating from college is kind of a motivation to the refugee kids for them also to know that they can make it, they can finish high school, they can go to college. Uh, I just want to add one thing more. So uh, recently we have uh, been um, joined with the RS, so that's the national report for the state. The state. Uh, we have uh, their, their database, so when we have the students, first of all, we are going to levelize them. Uh, with the CASAS test, if it is familiar for you. So we levelize the students and which level they are, then we are going to, according to their level, we're putting them in the classes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, we'll take one last question over here before we wrap up. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. Um, one of the questions I have about your research is certainly one of the things that I've um, noted with all of our refugee families, but particularly the Afghan uh, families, is the incredible strengths and the resilience. And I'm wondering if any of your uh, research will be tapping into their identified strengths so that we can better you know, support that from, you know, for, for those things that they identify as their strengths, because I, I, I'm uh, amazed at the amount of strength and resilience that these families exhibit. Um, that's my question. And it's a great question, and absolutely, we um, we were careful to make sure that we built that into the research project, the, sure. um, the interview protocol, to make sure that we, uh, can illuminate those strengths as well as help build on them um, in terms of helping um, the helping the individuals really uh, shine brighter. Like I like Mohibi um, was mentioning, education like is one of those key areas where it was completely cut off for a lot of people and. Um, I believe that, th that it came out in the research that that was one area where um, people really identified their strengths and interests lie was continuing with their education and their technical training. And so that's um, an example of something that came out in the research that we can also um, pass to the Refugee Dream Center and they can, uh, that has direct programmatic use because um, it's difficult, and I've had conversations with Mohibi before about the, 
the difficulty of transferring certain academic um, credentials or mm. programs to the US um, because it's not always the case that people want to start an education, uh, like start a program, they want to complete the program they began. So that's one thing that I know that the Refugee Dream Center is working on and something that came out really strongly in the research. I don't know if you wanted to add something to that. Yeah, it, it, is, it is correct. Uh, so I just want to add that most of the people that, uh, as you mentioned, that they, what they want to go continue with their education and they don't want to stop by mm -hmm. what they were. So most Afghan people, they like to go on mm -hmm. with that. So they don't want to start from the beginning. And it is a still barrier for them. So, uh, it needs evaluation of their transcript or the, the document that they have on their hands. Uh, most of the families, they couldn't bring it out here. So the, the way that they came, it, is, well, it, it was impossible to take all the important documentation with, with yourself. And um, Refugee Dream Center, they're going to evaluate the document for, uh, for families. Uh, they're still requesting the original ones. So it's also barrier. It, is, it takes time to be organized. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, uh, let's give a hand for our wonderful panelists again.